Last year, I learned a lesson I will never forget. Trust your gut. I had the day off from work. I wanted to do something fun, but everyone I knew was busy. Makes sense. I mean, it was a Tuesday. I decided I'd just go to the amusement park by myself. I've done it before and had a great time. I'm a bit of a thrill seeker. Well, not too much anymore. Going 5 miles over the speed limit is about all the excitement I want out of life anymore. I got to the park at around 2 p.m. It was slow, even for a Tuesday. It gave me a sense of excitement because I knew I'd be able to ride a lot of rides without having to be there all day. At the same time, it gave me a weird, uncanny feeling. All the space and not enough people to fill it up. I ignored the feeling and moved on. I don't know about you, but whenever I go to an amusement park, I like to work my way up to the really crazy rides. I'll start small and finish off the day with my favorite. My favorite just happened to be called the Grim Reaper. It feels a little too on the nose, doesn't it? It was 7.30pm, and the park closed at 8pm, and I knew it was time to get in line for my final ride. I also made a new friend while there. We met standing in line at one of my first rides of the day. We decided after chatting the whole time in line that we'd hang out for the rest of the day. His name was Charlie. We agreed on every ride that day, except for the last. He wanted to end the night on the Mindbinder, but after some convincing, aka the Mindbinder's line was way shorter while passing by, we decided to do the Grim Reaper last. We got in line for the Grim Reaper, and there was hardly anyone in line. It made sense, given that it was almost closing time. Do you think they will let us ride multiple times if the line stays down? Charlie said with his hands clasped excitedly in front of him. I just smiled at him and chuckled. Normally, I would have been excited too, but something in my gut felt so off. For some reason, I didn't want to go on one of my favorite rides. Maybe it was the five corn dogs I ate a couple hours earlier, I figured. I'm a very rational person. I wasn't the kind of person to let anxiety or worry rule over me. I always thought life was just what you made of it. When we got in line, there were about 60 people, give or take. The people in front of us did their ride, and 30 of us were left in line. People started looking at the time and saying they were tired and just getting out of line. By the time it was our turn, only 19 people were in line. I knew the ride well enough to remember that it held 20 people, so if no one else got in line, they really might let us go multiple times. I really didn't want that though. Honestly, I felt even more compelled to get out of line after all those others did too, and I didn't want to seem lame to my new friend if I wanted to get off the coaster after one ride. The time came for us to get on the ride. My heart was pounding faster than it ever had. I wondered if I was all worked up because I watched Final Destination 3 with a friend a couple weeks back. But I wasn't having visions of the terrible fate we would all face. I was just feeling off. I did everything in my power to get it to all make sense and to not worry, but nothing worked. I seriously considered just telling Charlie I didn't feel great after the last ride, but I finally found someone with my taste in roller coasters. I didn't want to let him down. We were towards the back of the line, so we didn't have much say in where we sat. We ended up in the third car from the front. I was just happy we weren't in the front car. As you get on the Grim Reaper, it plays a cheesy little jingle. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The Grim Reaper will find you dead or alive. With music in the background that always sounded so dumb in the past. I couldn't believe it was getting to me. Charlie even hummed along to it while grabbing my arm with happiness. We got in our seats, and an employee came by and pulled down the metal bar restraint to secure us in our seats. It was the kind that strapped you individually over your shoulder. I'm on the chubbier side, but I can always fit into coaster seats. I've never been told I couldn't go on a ride. I'm just sometimes a little snug. It's actually kind of nice, because I feel very secure. As we got strapped in, I felt the plastic coated metal hit my shoulders and chest. It should have given me a sense of comfort and safety, but I just felt trapped. The employee walked back to the station that has the infamous big button that starts the ride. He flashed all a thumbs up and yelled, 
Ready for the Reaper, everyone raised their hands and let out an excited scream. Except for me, I let out a large sigh, counting down the seconds, trying to imagine Charlie and I once we were off the ride and how happy we would be. The employee hit the button and we were off. The coaster shot out of the loading station like we were a bullet being shot out of a gun. After that, it started on a relatively slow ascent up a point to a drop off of 60 degrees, a couple of twists and turns, a big loop, and some more twists and turns. About halfway through the ride, I was enjoying myself. I was thinking about how the hard part was done and I was safe. Just a little anxiety was all. We were rounding out our last bend when a sense of relief came over me. I could see the end of the ride. I was almost done, but the ride didn't start to slow down. Normally, the coaster starts to slowly come to a full stop several hundred feet from the end, but it was still going. As we passed by the loading area, I saw the operators look confused as we raced by. I noticed no one else was waiting in line. Someone screamed. One more time, and everyone on board gave an excited response. Everyone except for me, Charlie looked over at me and grabbed my wrist. Yes, I knew they would let us keep going. This is awesome. He let out an excited yelp as we reached the climb to the drop. He was beaming with joy the whole rest of the lap. We passed by the loading area once again, but this time the coaster operator had a couple other people standing with him. The operator who strapped us looked red and worried. As we were whipped by the employees for our third ride of the day, the other riders were divided. Some were still excited, screaming, let's go, one more time, or best day ever, yeah. Some people started to sound scared. Not everyone noticed the employees looking frazzled. I can promise you one thing, I noticed. We started going up the incline again. This was the slowest part of the ride, at around 10 miles per hour and slowing down a little as it reached its peak. This gave us opportunities to take a breath or try to talk, although it was only for a total of about 20 seconds. Are, are we stuck? I said nervously to Charlie. I'm sure we are fine, there is just a malfunction with the electrical system not activating the brakes or something. There is always a manual shut off. He was cut off and we went down the steep hill. We passed by yet again, this time with more people looking worried and someone standing close to where the coaster would go by. He tried to yell at us as we went by, but we couldn't really understand him. Maybe something about them working on getting us off. This time, as we zoomed by, everyone was scared and starting to panic. I guess it didn't sink in for some people what was happening until right now. We went around a fifth time, and everything remained the same. On the sixth time, we were at the peak and saw a fire truck coming into the parking lot. From the top of the incline, we had a perfect view of the parking lot, along with the side of a highway a little further out. It took two more loops around the track by the time the fire department got to us. Not just them, but police officers and ambulances. It started to scare me. Why did they get ambulances? Is it just protocol? Or is there more to this? Someone came in a few minutes later with a big whiteboard that they used to write messages to us. The ride was too loud when passing by them to hear anything, so this was their only way to talk to us. It must have been the 12th or 13th time around when the whiteboard read, trying to free you at peak. I knew they couldn't write a novel for us because you can only read so much while going by so fast. But come on, people, what is that supposed to mean? I think they just wanted to tell us they were working on a way to get us down. But that didn't matter. We had been on this ride for nearly 30 minutes, and we felt sick, and our bodies hurt like crazy. A couple loops after that, we saw a fire truck trying to get underneath where the top of the ascend was. Luckily there was a large space where the truck could pull right beside it. Unfortunately at its peak it's about 200 feet in the air. It also didn't have any emergency exits at the top, like most coasters do. You'd think that would be a requirement, but what do I know? We saw the fire truck start to expand the ladder that comes out the top, but it wasn't even close. We waited for the firefighters to try and figure out a solution to save us, as the audience below us was watching us like we were some kind of show. It was close to 45 minutes when the first death occurred, then one more soon after. There was a skinnier guy in a car behind me. I heard him talking about trying to slip out of the seat restraint, which secured him to his seat. The other guy he was with told him it was a bad idea. So did I. 
The next time we went up the ascent, he began violently wiggling and thrashing back and forth to the point where people thought he was going to throw off the ride. He managed to wiggle about halfway out, right at the top, but, well, it didn't end very well. His leg got caught on a part of the track and yanked the rest of his body out of the bar restraint. It sent his body crashing down towards the earth. However, I think he was dead soon after he was ripped out of his seat. I didn't see too much of it, but the guy who was beside him let out an insane screech. Hearing that kind of agony as you are feeling the harsh effects of gravity hitting on your chest while going down a steep hill was truly mortifying. The screech out of nowhere stopped, and more people screamed. The man beside him had a heart attack. I could hear the symphony of moans and crying coming from the crowd watching us. I couldn't hear them before because of how loud the ride was, but they were terrified of what they saw. Police tried to escort them out of the park, but it didn't stop people from parking on the side of the road to watch and record on their phones. It made me feel disgusted. At around an hour on the ride, everyone stopped screaming or trying to talk to each other. It seemed like everyone accepted their fate. My nails were deeply embedded into Charlie's wrist. I couldn't scream anymore due to my throat feeling raw from the yelling. Even if I wanted to, I probably couldn't due to my voice giving out. I saw that I drew a little blood on Charlie, but he was too out of it to notice. He, along with a few other people, were incredibly sick. He threw up probably five times by this point and looked cross-eyed. Around that time, the electricity in the whole park shut down. All the lights, everything. I think they were hoping a hard reboot of the whole park would stop the ride. The coaster didn't just rely on gravity, but also on a lot of help from motors and other electronic elements. It all turned off when we were on the straightaway. Of course, it still didn't stop. I could hear someone yelling with frustration, not understanding how it could still be moving if it didn't have an electrical source. After two hours, they let some family members come into the loading area, which was a terrible idea. We were doing our best to keep cool and stay calm. Our families watching us, zooming by them every two minutes, and absolutely screaming at us, made it so much worse. My mom was my first family member to show up. Don't get me wrong, I love my mom, but she is very stubborn and wanted something done even though they had already tried everything. Of course, it was just because she wanted me safe, but it was stressing me out. The firefighters put down a safety net underneath the ascent. It was still quite a jump if we could even get out successfully to land on it. And we might be okay, but we were all a little scarred from what happened before. It seemed like they put it out just in case someone tried to get out again. It didn't seem like it was the plan to have us all just jump out of that moving death machine. They weren't desperate enough at that point. We saw a large group of people passionately arguing and yelling at each other. From what I could tell, it was made up of family members, firefighters, and some employees of the park. I'm sure with lots of varying opinions. The ride was on hour 3. When the coaster entered the loading area once again, I saw a woman run over to the control panel. A couple people ran over to her and told her to stop and not press the button. She was screaming her head off and wailing. It had been hard to understand people in the past while going by them, but this was as clear as day. As we passed by, I could tell she was starting to break free from the grip of people holding her back. I wasn't too worried. Whatever button she was wanting to press, I'm sure it wouldn't work since none of the other ones worked so far. We were about 5 seconds away from going down the descent when we heard a click come from all our seats. The woman hit the button that unlocked all our overhead seat belts. Of course, the seat belt button worked, but not the button to stop the ride. A few people reacted fast enough to either jump out or snap it back over themselves before the ride went down. Others weren't so lucky. Three people managed to jump out but didn't survive the fall. Despite there now being a giant net to catch anyone who was dumb enough to try and get out that high, one person hit a support beam on the way down, and the other two landed wrong when they hit the net. Their bodies folded in an unnatural manner as they hit. All three died instantly. I would say around half of us that were left managed to get the seatbelt secured before going down the hill. Everyone else had to hold on for dear life, and unfortunately, I was one of them. I felt my stomach start to drop as I reached up to grab the only thing that would keep me from becoming a part of the pavement below. The restraint wasn't completely useless at this point. I just had a good 12 inches in between my chest and the restraint. As I dug my fingers into the plastic, I hoped I would be fine. 
Then the ride dropped. I felt my butt lift off the seat I had become so familiar with. I tried to wrap my ankles around the floor of the coaster to keep the rest of my body from flying out. Charlie luckily got the restraint down, so he was trying to get his leg over mine and hold me down with his arm. After the longest five seconds of my life, I managed to pull it back down over my chest. I wasn't sure who else got theirs down, but I assumed, from how scared a few of them sounded, it wasn't good. All I could think about and look at was the big loop coming up. As we got closer, I could hear swearing from multiple passengers, including someone in front of me. She was violently pulling at the restraint, but it just wasn't budging. I was hoping and praying that the centrifugal force would keep her in her seat. As we went around the big loop, I closed my eyes. I knew I didn't want to see what was about to happen. I heard multiple people screaming and making horrendous cracking sounds. I don't have an exact number, but I would say only seven people were left. I could see the two people in the very front row and Charlie beside me. I recall only hearing three other voices behind me at this point. At hour five, three more people died while on the ride. Two of them from a heart attack or something. The third person, well, he watched the person beside him suddenly die while going around one of the bends. He yelled out in anger and he, um, well, I'd actually rather not go into detail. But he died soon after. I saw the whole thing. They were the two people left in front of me and Charlie. At hour six, we saw a group of people bringing in what looked like another large net except that it was in the loading area. The next time we looped around, they wrote something new on the big whiteboard. We are going to try and stop it manually. I had no clue what this meant, but by the look of the net, I was terrified. The next pass, there were people on both sides of the loading area. On one side, the net was wrapped around a large pole that had been somehow fastened into the concrete slab. I saw a large, similar pole on the other side, but the net wasn't yet attached. As we zoomed by, I could hear people trying to rush and hurry behind us. We went around one of the turns and I cranked my neck, looking to see what plan they had in mind. They were frantically trying to tie the other side of the net to the support beam that was freshly drilled into the ground. I couldn't believe how stupid these people were. How on earth did they think this was a good idea? Was this a last ditch attempt? I was yelling at them and telling them to stop, but of course they couldn't hear me. Even if they could, they wouldn't listen. They were desperate to get at least someone out of this alive. Or maybe the owner of the park wanted all of us to die so that no one could publicly talk about the horrific things we went through. As we went past the last bend, the hundreds of people watching the spectacle cheered, clapped, and celebrated, somehow not seeing any of the flaws with this terrible plan. We were on the straightaway, and my heart started to pound again. The few seconds before we hit the net felt like slow motion. I swore I could see everyone's face. They looked happy. I couldn't believe it. It made me upset because I knew they were all about to be very disappointed. Finally, we hit the net. Of course, it was no match for a giant metal contraption hitting it. The metal pole was ripped out of the concrete slab and smashed down right in between our car and the one behind us. As we headed for the incline, we tried to get the net that attached itself to us off of the coaster. Luckily, we were able to get it off of us, but no luck with the metal beam that was now awkwardly lodged in the coaster. As we started going down, the whole ride started to shake violently. It felt like we were going to fly off the track. We made it to the first turn. I heard a loud snap and two screams. The seven coaster cars behind ours broke off and the metal beam found its way underneath. As we turned, I watched in disbelief as the cars behind us all went flying off the tracks. At that point in the ride, it was about 50 feet off the ground, still enough to kill them. I wasn't fast enough to close my eyes and saw the whole thing. It went off the track like it had wings and suddenly plummeted down into the earth. The screaming immediately stopped when the ride landed upside down. My imagination filled in the blanks and shuddered at the thought of the carnage below me. And then there were two. We were hoping that somehow the ride would stop or slow down, because we lost the back seven cars. I was not sure what the logic was, but we were desperate at this point. After another hour, it was not showing any signs of slowing down. Once we made it to hour eight, we expected our fate. I was hoping that this would all be over soon and we could just be done. I don't think either one of us thought we'd get off. We just hoped, at this point, that our deaths would be quick. 
Over the next couple hours, we noticed a piece of metal on the car ahead of us start to wobble and loosen. I'm not sure if it was just the wear and tear of the ride going for so long or the whole net fiasco. It kept looking like it was about to come loose, and we duck out of the way. We were imagining the worst possible outcome, thinking it would fly off and decapitate one of us. Eventually, it did come off, but it wasn't a dramatic moment like we thought it would be. It was so much worse. Instead of coming all the way off, it only partially came off and started grinding loudly against the track. We heard an audible cringing sound from everyone watching below. The sound was horrendous. The thin strip of metal started to find its way underneath the car. Charlie was worried it would dislodge the coaster from its tracks like we saw just hours before. He told me he was going to try and grab it. I begged him not to. After a few laps of me telling him to just leave it, he made up his mind and contorted his body to try and grab the sharp metal. I couldn't see his hand as he reached down for it, but I could see his face. Somehow, that made it worse. His expression quickly changed from focused to shocked in a matter of seconds. His face was blank. I heard screaming but had no clue what was going on. He lifted up his arm and, I don't think I will ever be able to get the image of what used to be his arm out of my head. When he gripped the metal, it slipped and went deep into his forearm. I tried to grab his shoulder to calm him down, but to my shock, he was calm. He was more silent at that moment than he had been the whole day. He wouldn't even look at me. He was almost mesmerized by the sight of his bloodied, disfigured arm. I felt lightheaded and had a ringing in my ears. Watching the blood start to make its way down his entire body, then to me in the floor of the coaster. It was making me feel sick watching the blood move around the car as we went around the twists and turns of the ride. Within minutes, Charlie looked like a ghost. I did my best to try and wrap his arm up with shreds of my shirt, but it was completely pointless. I don't think an old t-shirt can help when you see the bone. I tried to talk to him. I tried to make him feel as comfortable as I could, but it was no use. He was fading in and out of consciousness. We began going up the ascent, and he finally looked over at me. I couldn't begin to explain all that I saw in his eyes. I could see the pain and sadness, but also the relief. He knew he was going to die, but I don't think he cared. He gave me a weak nod of the head and looked ahead when we went down the hill. I tried to keep a close eye on him this lap, but it was honestly hard to look at him. I heard him take a deep breath right before the loop. When we finished the loop, I looked over at him and, well, he was gone. I was now left alone in the death trap. I never imagined it could have gotten any worse, but having a dead body sitting next to you on a roller coaster is not something I would recommend. I was sitting in shock next to my dead friend for a couple hours. I was frozen in fear, not wanting to even think of a way out. After gaining some courage, I contemplated my next move. I came back into reality and realized the coaster was going just slightly slower. It wasn't significant, but if the loops were taking just slightly longer than before, that damn piece of metal that killed Charlie must have made its way underneath and not derailed it, but slowed it down. I ended up taking off my shoes and Charlie's shoes. I had a plan that was probably dumb, but if I died, at least it would be in my hands. As I went by the loading area, the coaster started to slow down just before the ascent. I threw all four shoes right in front of the ride. A part of a shoe caught the truck in just the right spot. The ride was still. I could feel the coaster almost pulsing, trying to move with all its might. I was sore. My shoulders were badly buried by the shoulder restraints, repeatedly hitting me over and over again. My whole lower half aching from sitting in a hard seat for hours on hours. I took a deep breath and squeezed in my gut like I never had before. I let out a horrific yell as I forced my body out of the restraint that had been holding me down for the last 12 hours, about 360 times around the track. My heart was racing as I felt the coaster start to win the battle to move again. I managed to squeeze out just seconds before it took off. I was freed and jumped. Luckily, I just barely hit the net below. I also managed to hit the net, so I didn't hurt myself too badly. Nothing is worse than what that ride already did to me. I laid on the net, looking up into the sky, in disbelief. I was still. I wasn't moving. It was almost making me feel motion sick not moving around. Like when you are reading a book in the car and you look up after an hour. 
Everything was blurry, I could barely hear the faint sound of people trying to get to me, but it was mostly just my ears ringing and my heart beating. After just a few minutes, I was down. They immediately rushed me to the ER where I stayed for three weeks. I sustained a broken rib, a broken collarbone, severe bruising, and a concussion, just to name a few. Not to mention the mental trauma. I'm writing this as I'm feeling ready to finally tell my story. This is the first time I'm digging back into my memories and recollecting the whole experience. I've started to work through all this with a therapist, and it's made me realize I need to get it all out of my system. Don't bother trying to find anything about this story. The owners of the park have done a suspiciously good job hiding it. That's another reason I want to get my story out there. They have completely scrubbed the internet of it somehow. Although talking with a professional has helped, there are still some sounds and images that I can just never completely get out of my head. If you take one thing from my story, it's that you should trust yourself. Even if you don't believe in a higher power or gut instincts, if you have a feeling, trust it, please.